These are Tibetans, but this is not Tibet. These children are the dispossessed of our century, together with those thousands of others who have managed to escape the iron rule of Chinese communism. Members of an ancient nation, now without a country, forced out of their native land since the Peking regime overran their helpless, peaceful country. After that tragedy, thousands of them have made their way over the Himalayas to India and other countries around the world. Today, in different places, they are reassembling broken lives. Friendly countries, international agencies, humanitarian organizations, all those who cherish freedom and mourn its loss are helping in this process of rehabilitation. The challenge before the Tibetan refugees is twofold. To exist in a foreign environment, to earn a livelihood there, and yet to retain their culture, their identity as a people. Living in different parts of India, among the hospitable Indian people, the Tibetans are quick to adapt themselves, to absorb the new and yet to retain the old, keeping alive faith in the way of the Buddha, trying to push aside the nightmare horror they knew in Tibet under communist rule, hoping someday for the freedom and peace they inherited from their forefathers. These children, orphans many of them, have never seen the land of their birth. Although they learn of them, they have never seen the sources in Tibet of some of the world's longest and mightiest rivers that irrigate China, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, Pakistan and India. Here in their new homes, they learn of their great king, Song Tsen Gampo, and his minister, Tomi Sambhota, who first gave an alphabet to the Tibetan language. Here they learn of the freedom that was once theirs in the form of an inscription still existing of a treaty signed in the second half of the 8th century. The sovereign of Tibet, the divine king of miracles, and the great king of China have made this great agreement. They have agreed that Tibet and China shall guard and protect the territory and frontiers of which they have hitherto held possession. Whatever lies to the east of the frontier is the country of Great China. Whatever lies to the west is surely the country of Great Tibet. Henceforth the two countries shall not fight as enemies and neither side shall wage war into the other's territory. If this agreement be violated, whether Tibet or China violates it first, a sin will have been committed. Can anyone imagine the peace-loving people of Tibet waging war against anyone? Long ago, the Tibetan people abandoned the idea of violence and affirmed their faith in the jewel of the Buddha's light. Long before the days of Marco Polo and of Kublai Khan, who officially recognized Tibetan sovereignty in 1270, Tibetans had accepted the way of the Buddha. In the words of Milarepa, the great Tibetan poet, in fear of death and insecurity, I built a house with walls. Now my house has no walls. It is surrounded by the space and infinity of truth. Now I do not fear death.